What is going on, Clippers fans? Welcome back to Clips and Dip. This is season two, episode 53.1. Uh, we're back after the All-Star break. The Clippers play basketball tomorrow night. We're all very excited about it. I am Chuck Mockler, joined by Adam Oslin and Will Updike. We're going to get to how we're feeling, but today we're talking Clippers versus Thunder. It's a very big game for the standings. We're talking the back-to-back -back the Clippers to come, the Clippers come back to. There was some wonderful uh, X Clipper uh, fights happening over the All Star break. We're all very excited. Basketball's back, so that can stop. But before we get into it, Adam, Will, how are you guys doing on Clippers comeback to basketball Eve? Adam, we'll start with you. How was your All Star break? Uh, it was better than the actual All Star game. I'll tell you that much. I played better defense against myself, I guess, during the All Star break and. Had a buddy hang out. We had a good time. Uh, you know, recharge, regroup, and get ready for March, as as you know all too well, Jeff. <laughs> Will, or Will, were you rationing uh, supplies for this upcoming March schedule? Uh, uh, how was your day? Not yet. Not yet. Um, no. Uh, looking forward to this hellacious stretch of games for the Clippers, <laughs> which is still somehow the quiet before the storm. Um, which I'm sure we're going to talk about. So yeah, doing, I'm, I'm doing good, man. Nice. Yeah. I had a good break. We got some free comics, which was cool. Uh, from Ryan Perro. I read, Shout out Ryan Perro. yeah, I read power Rangers comics now, apparently. Uh, yeah. Thanks to everyone who's listening. Thanks to everyone who's watching over on YouTube. Um, let's get into this Clippers thunder game preview. There's no injuries for the Clippers, which is fantastic. Uh, the official Moose is loose. Dude, the Moose might be loose. Someone asked about him in the comments on Twitter if Moose is going to play, and I I don't think it's in the cards. Um, we got to feel good about the health. Gordon Hayward set to make his debut um, for the Thunder. I don't know. Adam, we're at another like most important game of the year standing-wise. It kind of sucks it's the game after the All-Star break, right? I don't know. They got healthy. It's probably better than having it before the All-Star break because the Clippers weren't playing that well. Uh, if you just look two and two, their last four, they were kind of alternating wins and losses, even while they had three of those games at home. And I looked over the last 15 games, they're 17th defensively. And that's post Feels right. the beatdown of what happened in OKC and then what happened at home against Boston, which could skew the numbers, but that's after that. So, yeah, defensively, they got to tighten things up. They have to play much better. And there's going to be a lot of these games coming up. But this one in particular, considering this is the final game against OKC, it's the rubber game. The head-to-head -head tiebreaker will be decided tomorrow night. It's big time. Uh, it's not going to be easy in OKC. We know how good they are. And they were playing much better basketball than the Clippers over the last 10 games heading into this one, heading into the All-Star break. But... You just like the fact that the Clippers are healthy. And there were some comments from James Harden that I saw on Law Murray's Twitter talking about how it's about attention to detail now. You know, we can't beat ourselves any longer. We have to make the other team beat us and basically just tighten everything up with just 29 games remaining heading into the playoffs. Yeah, it's kind of been wonky facing the Thunder this year. We haven't been able to give them like our best. We didn't have Kawhi. We didn't have Zoo. Um, obviously, PG was great in that game without Zoo. That's how we get the win. But, like, this is, I mean, it's kind of nice, I guess, for, for the neutral fan um, that this is going to be a 100% to 100% matchup. Um, Will, what are you looking forward to most, or I guess maybe least, um, from this, this Thunder team? I mean, a team that could al already readily drop 130 on you is, is adding another offensive piece, which... You know, we'll see how the integration works and, and, and how quickly they're able to do that. But, um, yeah, that, I mean, it's it's a good addition for them. Another wing, which will tax a smaller Clippers team when they have to worry about more than just guards kind of going off. And then, I mean, they already have size, like, they already have size, I guess, across the board. So, um, yeah, it's, it, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. I'm going to be interested in what, I like I don't know what my expectations are for the offense the first game back from the All-Star break. I want it to be very good. I know that it's not going to be at its best, but Zoo's going to be healthy, which obviously helps the defense a lot. But like maybe the I'm hoping the pick and roll looks a little bit better. Um and we've talked about this a little bit. I hope James Harden if he gets forced into the mid-range looks a little bit better. 
Um, he shot like his worst percentage in almost 10 years from three to 10 feet right now. Um, everything else is great, but that's just the one thing where I think defenses are going to push him towards. Um, yeah. So I'm excited to see what the offense looks like on some full rest, um, especially from zoo. I also want to see them get off. Obviously it's asking a lot because the Clippers have struggled recently. They were much better in this area overall this season, but recently they've been really bad in first quarters. Again, they are 23rd in net rating their last five games in first quarters. Damn. And it's looked the part. They've been getting off to very slow starts. We've kind of wondered whether or not, you know, that road trip took something out of them, that seven game Grammy road trip, and there were still residual fe- effects from that, those last four games before the All Star break. But They have to, speaking of tightening things up, they have to start much faster, especially against OKC, a team that pretty much is the new analytics team out there outside of the Houston Rockets with James Harden and Mike D'Antoni because it's drives and it's threes. It's a lot of that stuff. They lead the league in drives per game by a pretty wide margin. And then, you know, they don't take quite as many three-pointers as the Houston Rockets did back in the day or anything like that. They're actually, I think, middle in the middle of the pack like uh, the Clippers are. But they shoot a really high percentage from the outside. They're right behind the Clippers. They're number one at 39.5% from three. OKC is 39.3% from the outside. So they can beat you from the outside. They can beat you then driving by you and getting to the basket. That's a lot of SGA, of course, but they have a ton of slashers. They have a ton of youth and young guys and fresh legs that probably would have been fine without an all-star break out of all the teams <laughs> in the league. <laughs> so getting that and their opportunity to recharge at home waiting for the Clippers, that's a big advantage. But you take some of that away if you can just get off to a quick start in the ball game and char- start to impose your will right off the bat and get back to having that defensive mentality, something they've all also been lacking as i mentioned the last 15 games just 17th overall defensively yeah i was just looking at the uh their shot distribution they're you're right as you said they're right in the middle of the pack with three pointers they're also right in the middle of the pack with two pointers they take the 14th most two pointers and the 16th most threes so like they're kind of hitting from everywhere um they're not leaning one heavy one side i like what you said about the analytics it's like the analytics distribution kind of like everything went crazy with D'Antoni and now they're kind of figuring it out more um, with the, with the thunder. Yeah. Defensively, it's going to be weird. I think, right? Like, will we saw Jalen Williams kill us and then he was on the bench for the other game. Um, so like, I'm, I, we know what their big guys can do. I'm worried about one of these not random. Cause that feels more disrespectful than I mean it, but one of these bench thunder guys can do right. Like they kind of have sneaky scoring depth on their team. Especially now adding Gordon Hayward, that's somebody who offers more depth, a veteran presence out there. Uh, I know he doesn't have a ton of playoff experience, but this is somebody who was an all-star, has a lot of pride, and is somebody they can lean on a little bit at times and just know what he's capable of. He's been in the league for so long now. He had the injury. He's not the same player that he used to be, but he's still more than serviceable. And I always worry about guys that have a change of scenery like that where they were playing meaningless ball games and now they have an opportunity to be one of the best teams in their conference and what that can do and bring out of them. I think that's going to be a big pickup uh, for this OKC Thunder team. But last time out, I believe it was, yeah, Isaiah Joe had 15 points off the bench against them. He was really good in that Clippers 128 to 117 victory at crypto where PG 13 had 19 of his 38 in the fourth quarter. But they definitely have guys coming at you in waves off the bench you have to account for. Yeah, and the bench defense, now that we've had some rest from, you know, Russ and Norm's probably fully recovered. I still don't think he was 100% heading into the All-Star break after getting hit in the head. Um, that'll be big. Um, yeah, Will, Adam mentioned the defense. What do we do? We, or do we just need Zoo to be back? And will, like, will we be happy with the defense? Uh, I mean, that's obviously a, a major piece, and um, I'm hoping that he looks <clears throat> a lot better given the long break. But it's it's also going to be difficult to to cover this team. You guys mentioned the bench, like our our bench defensive like isn't really known as a defensive unit. Um, so that that's going to be uh, that's going to be difficult for for those guys. They're going to have to you know 
keep up the keep up the pace, which they are, you know, willing to do and, and well equipped on that second unit to um, at least kind of keep things even if a couple of these bench guys for the Thunder end up popping. But you know, it, it's going to come down to matchups and and how they're able to curb Shea. Um, you know, we saw a lot of different looks at him. Um, I think if I'm not mistaken, I was just looking at it here. Um, Paul George, Kawhi, and James and James Harden all played the played the most on him. It's like one of those things where you look at he, you know, he that he got his fewest field goal attempts off, like while those guys were on him. But you look at how much the team was still scoring over those stretches. There's like a two minute stretch where Thunder still had like 20 team points. So uh, <laughs> and, and and it wasn't all Shea assisted. Um, but it, it it's one of those things where it's it's just one head at the snake. Um, but it, it you know that's. It's obviously the matchup. Um, that's kind of the marquee matchup and how they're able to distribute those minutes. And then likewise, I mean, if they aren't able to slow down some of these guys, like who is going to get things going quickly? Um, I think, you know, the way that we kind of went into the all-star break, I, you know, it was good to get the comeback victory. And I think we were all feeling a lot better, uh, especially after like the upset of the Timberwolves games. But the, the way that we have looked as of late, hasn't been particularly inspiring. Um, and, and I'm curious to see like what what the malaise of a long break does really for both teams and, and how that affects them. And the guy that I'm going to be really watching in this one, especially if the Clippers have trouble um, stopping this Thunder team, is what is Paul George going to look like offensively? Um, so I know you asked me about the defense, but there you go. No, that's fair. Because Paul, I mean, Paul George, he's the groin thing was so it was brutal. He was so up and down, so streaky. Some nights he'd have it, sometimes he wouldn't. He was good on the defensive end. Um ish. Yeah. Come, yeah. Like came came and went. I I think that was some of the things that was like more troubling about that Paul stretch post groin injury was like you know, he's going to go through stretches where he, he doesn't have it, you know, where he's not you know, he's not having it, the offensive production that he did to start the season. But I think some, like some of the more troubling stuff was him just looking out of place and a little lost out there. I always think that that stuff is a little bit more like these are the things you can still control, you know, that are still within your control. You can't really – it's not up to you if the shots fall down or not. Like that's not really your determination, but – <clears throat> like what you're doing, especially for Paul on the defensive end of the floor, says a lot about what, like what you can still contribute. And not to get down on the guy, but like it just wasn't, you know, he he, he was one of many Clippers who I, I I I wasn't giving flying marks going into the All Star break. You're trying to light a fire. You're not trying to get down on him. You're trying to light a fire for the, exactly. the yeah right fans out there. Okay, sorry Adam, go ahead. No, I think it's going to tell a lot about where Paul George is at in this game physically. And how he's feeling out there because it just seemed like he was trying to bide his time. Just get to the all-star break, get some days off. He still played in the all-star game. I think knocked down a couple of three-pointers. But that fourth quarter against Golden State before he fouled out, and those last two fouls were bad fouls. He was being overly aggressive when you want to talk about not playing well enough defensively. That last foul against Draymond Green just shouldn't happen. But I like what we saw offensively from him in that fourth quarter. He was forcing the issue a little bit more. And while he was one for seven from three in that game, he was seven of ten from two. And eventually he kind of just went away from the three ball in that fourth. I want to see that level of aggressiveness from PG-13. Get some easy ones too if they're not falling from the outside because I don't want to see this Clippers team, and it may end up this way because they're two of the best offenses in the league, but have to win a shootout in OKC like they won back at home in that game where they knocked down 23-pointers. OKC had 16. They basically just outshot them, and PG-13 was unbelievable down the stretch, and then you had the Kawhi block on SGA. I don't know how repeatable that is on the road in OKC against that team with that home court advantage and that crowd behind them. <coughs> You want to see them get back to playing much better defense. And to what Chuck was saying earlier, is it as simple as just having Avica Zubas be healthy? Another big test for him. Let's see how big Zoo is moving out there. He also looked really good late in the fourth quarter before he went out, ended up playing almost 30 minutes in that game against Golden State. That's really the best he had looked. So some days off for him and Paul George and Kawhi Leonard. Hopefully it does wonders for this Clippers team just health-wise. Yeah, you mentioned the Paul George thing and being aggressive in those last two games. Um, he took 15 free throws 
combined in the last two games. He averages four a game this year. It's one of his lowest averages um, of his career. So, and when we went on the win streak, um, the big win streak, I believe I'm 90% sure it coincided with him getting not much higher because it's not like he's going to the line double digits or anything like that. But like if he's getting, if Paul George is getting even six free throws a game, it kind of drastically changes um, what he can do offensively. So I, I, I like what you said about like he made the conscious decision to be more aggressive and go to the basket. Um, Cause pe- teams are pushing Ka- uh, the Clippers into the mid range, but Kawhi is the only guy who's really built to really succeed there um, as a first option and that kind of thing. Well, and they need to test Chet Holmgren like they did against Rudy Gobert. You're going to lose some of those battles, but you still have to go after that guy who I ha- I think had eight or nine blocks in a game against, what, Denver at one point mm-hmm. this season. So it's not easy, but it's not like he's the thickest and most well-built guy at this point of his career. He's kind of got a bird chest to him. You can, as, as big as Paul George is, you can go at him some. So – against a team that's going to take a lot of twos at the rim with those drives and the OKC Thunder, you got to try to match it a little bit. And the one area the Clippers had been much better in overall the last 15 games was points in the paint. We saw that being a point of emphasis going into that road trip. It really changed for them. It just seemed like they were unveiling a different part of their offense where they knew, okay, we have to get back to what was the old saying from uh, Coach Lou, 50 Cent? get to the paint or die trying, it seemed like they were much more intent on doing that. So I want to see that continue. Will, do you think you could bench more than Chet Holmgren? No, I don't think so. Well, wait, what, what does he bench? I don't know. I just, I'm, I'm going purely off the bird chest you, comment. You can't bench oh. 135? <laughs> I can bench 135. <laughs> I don't know what he benches. No, I don't know no. if it's a Kevin Durant-like thing. Uh, I, so Speaking but, of bigs, though, like – Daniel Tice played 20 minutes in that win, a, a guy who is no longer in the rotation. I, I'm just curious, what do you guys think about how those minutes get distributed? Um, and like, what, what does it look like for Plum? I mean, Plum had a solid game, 15-5-2 um, and two last time out, but Tice played like 20 minutes, like I said. Uh, also solid game. He was plus nine in the box score. Um, yeah, so I guess – is, it, is, I want he, to see, is he not going to play? I want to see better Plumley. I know the question was maybe about Tice, but Plumley did not go into the All Star break on the upswing. Um, I the think, Warriors game, he was better. That yeah, quarter. that's true. That's a really good call. He was Overall, fired up. Though, no. <laughs> yeah, um, he was fired up, which was great. So maybe that is maybe that that's something he can kind of bottle up for the last week or whatever and get into it. But Tice, if Plumley isn't playing well, I think Tice will play. Um, cause we've seen Lou kind of switch that, but I, man, I really hope Plumlee's looking good real quick. I found some data on the Chet Holmgren thing. Apparently during the draft, uh, you know, combine thing, he couldn't lift the 185 bench, uh, that they do. So it is like KD. He couldn't do it either at the combine. Yeah, so it's like KD. I think you could bench. That's why they drafted him. They're like, we got to yeah, take all the guys that are skinny as F and can't lift 185 and they're going to turn out to be superstars. <laughs> I think you could do it. What does uh, lifting weights got to do with hoops, man? <laughs> You've always Absolute, said that. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> you know, PJ Tucker can bench 450. I have it on the 40. <laughs> I mean, I bet. Yeah, that's look, look how much playing time he gets. So, yeah. definitely working out for him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Adam, where are you at on the backup bench? He should bench the whole bench in between <laughs> breaks. You know, he spends so much time over there. <laughs> Bench the bench. Uh, I, Zubats wasn't in that game last time out, so I expect him to soak up 25 plus minutes, and it's probably going to be Mason Plumley getting the first opportunity. Uh, that's just the pecking order. I think it makes sense. Overall, Mason Plumley is a true seven footer coming off the bench for you against someone like Chet Holmgren. You need a guy like that. And to Will's point, he played pretty well in that game against OKC in the victory back at uh, Crypto. Yeah, it's going to be interesting how they play the pick and roll with Chet because he can be the handler or the screener. So if he's the screener, I'm assuming they're going under, but maybe not. I don't know. Um, yeah, this game, I'm nervous for this game, but I'm mostly excited because everyone's healthy on both sides. So we get to see a full-on Western Conference Finals type preview thing, which is 
Again, always happy for the neutral fan. That's who I'm most concerned about in these scenarios. Um, go sports. Go sports. We love sports. Um, okay, now we get to the most important part. We haven't done this for like a week. Had plenty of time to think about it. Who is our, your, if also if you're listening or watching, you can vote on this. If you want to give us an at on the YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash at Clippers podcast, let us know you're Kawhi Leonard player of the game. It cannot be Kawhi Leonard, uh, but that's who it's named after. <laughs> Uh, Will, who is your Kawhi Leonard player of the game pick? Uh, we talked about it a little bit, but I'm going Paul George. I'm, I'm, I'm ready for a big bounce back game. I, you talked about how great he was that fourth quarter in the Warriors. Let's let's see it for four quarters or three. Blow him out. Oh. No starters in the fourth. Uh, that would be great. Uh, Adam, your Kawhi Leonard player of the game. I'm going to go with James Harden, who – Struggled a little bit the first two games against OKC. Mentioned the quote from him earlier. They need to be more detail-oriented right now. They need to be more focused, more laser-focused. And I want to see it from him because even in that victory they had over OKC, he was just 5 of 14. I did have eight assists to just one turnover with those 16 points on 5 of 14 shooting. But I think uh, they're probably going to need more from him just because it's likely going to be a game played in the 115s, 120s at least. So an efficient night from James Harden, plus he's got to take care of the basketball. What did he do over the All-Star break? Do we know? I'm assuming he was not in Indiana. Chill be my guess. Chill. Hey, Chill. there we go. Hey, good enough for me. Resting um, up. He's been playing heavy minutes, by the oh, way. Yeah. If there's mm -hmm. a guy who needed rest, it was definitely James Harden. You look at... Hasn't missed the game either. He was averaging 38 minutes over the last seven games for the Clippers, almost. It's a lot. It's made borderline maybe too many. Um, you guys went with two starters, which is totally fair. So I'm going to go bench. We haven't even talked about him yet, this preview. We need Russell Westbrook to be good at the rim in this game. The Clippers are going to need some bench help. We know what Norm Powell is there to do, which is make threes. He's done that very well all season, especially in the fourth. We need Russ to maybe be efficient Russ. Don't take threes. Just make your shots at the rim. That would go a long way to the Clippers uh, winning this game, is having not a frantic Russ performance, but a focused Russ performance. I think that's uh... – that's what we all want. And he was obviously good in that game down the stretch against the Golden State Warriors. Absolutely. That was one of the blueprints of how Russ can affect winning and affect the game. And he kind of talked about it post game after the 15 point comeback, saying, There's a lot more you can do out there. There's a lot more I can do, I think, is what he said. It's not just about points that affect winning. And those hustle plays, I think he had four offensive rebounds, and yeah. most of them came in the fourth Love quarter. That. Had another one where he tipped it off, uh, yeah. a warrior. That's what we need from him. Scrappy Russ, I'm here for that. And may, and as we talked about before the break, if we're going to play him in a small ball lineup, four other shooters around him. Let's have Russ out there with four other shooters. He can be the cog. He can do all the good chaos center stuff. And the Clippers will be fine. I believe the Clippers are two-point underdogs right now, um, which is pretty good for an away spread. Uh, we're going to have a double dip, I believe, right, Adam, after after this game tomorrow? Who's coming with me, boys? Oh, it's dependent on win or loss? I, I believe so. Uh, That's fair. We can yeah. do that. We can, <laughs> I, hey, sure. Your call. We can definitely do that. Sounds great. Um, coming up, we're going to be talking the Clippers game on Friday because, of course, it wouldn't be Clippers season without coming back from the All-Star break on a back-to-back -back, um, and then the, as well um, as the Kings game on Sunday. We got an update on the bobblehead giveaway. All that's coming up. If you're listening to the podcast, which we thank you for, the ads have been a little loud for some people. If that's been the case for you, uh, go ahead and turn it down. We got ads coming up in three, two, one. All right. Welcome back into Clips and Dip. We just looked ahead to the Clippers' first game coming out of the All Star break, taking on the Thunder. Big matchup, but it's not the end of the road. They got <laughs> fly to. They, they got to take on the Memphis Grizzlies the next day. Um, so good news for people who like quantity basketball over quality basketball. Um, how do you guys feel about this one? Um, is like, 
out of teams you could play, I guess, on the second night of a back-to-back. I mean, I'm glad it's not the Celtics again or something, but, um, yeah. I I mean, it's the lowest-scoring team in the league. They're the bottom of the league in a lot of categories. Well, so many injuries. I mean, it's Right. Just, no, it's, this it's, isn't – yeah. Ridiculous. Their again. season was over before it started, it almost feels like. They had the John ja Morant thing hanging over right. their head with the suspension. And then everybody got hurt, and then he came back, and he got hurt. It's just unbelievable. Yeah, horrible luck. I, you know, that wasn't a, a dig at the quality of their players right now. It's just they don't have anyone who's supposed to be there, really, um, in major roles, which is difficult to win. Um, but if there's any team that's going to want to make some kind of statement after a bunch of rest, it's a team like this. So this is second night of a back-to-back against a team that's not very good. This is a Clipper. This is the textbook Clippers draft game right here. Talk about slow starts. This is a team that's just going to, I assume, sprint up and down the court to open this game against the Clippers. The Memphis Grizzlies had lost nine in a row before winning their last two games before the All-Star break, including that victory over the Bucks that had Doc Rivers say he felt like half the team was in Cancun or whatever, or Cabo. I... We'll talk more about that in a little bit. But yeah, we will. They did go out on a high note heading into that All Star break, getting their probably their best victory of the season, winning that game over Milwaukee. Yeah, I mean that it's they're on a borderline streak. They beat the they beat the Rockets and then they beat the Bucks and now they got us. So I don't know. I, I'm running down the just kind of the Memphis. I'm looking at the box score. I don't watch a bunch of Memphis games. No disrespect to the Bucks. I just have a team in the Western Conference to focus on. Um, Will, what's your scouting report on Vince Williams Jr.? Give us all you got on Vince Williams Jr. Uh, great prospect. <laughs> <laughs> Scrappy guy. Um, this is you know, He goes in there and he does the work. All right? That's the thing. <laughs> He gets he boards, man. Yeah, he gets uh, a lot of boards. For for a smaller guy, it's 6'4". He's got some uh, Pat Bev hustle in him. He will go up there. And that's, you know, they you still – you can bench more than him? No, I don't think I can bench more than anyone in the NBA. Who has an arm injury? I might be able Adam's to. Adam's <laughs> Adam good. could. No, Adam, <laughs> I, I think – I have no doubt that Adam or Will could outbench Chet Holmgren. Oh, Yeah. I, mean, I think that might be the list, though. No dis. One eighty is the one eighty is the bar. One eighty five. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I think that's the list. I put up two sixty five earlier today. I could probably outbench a few guys. You think KD can do? No. No, he can't do that. I, he's bulked up. He's gained probably sure. 15, 20 pounds since he first came in. But yeah, I don't think that's something he focuses on at all. <laughs> what if? What if late stage KD? <laughs> Just started, just started doing just all chest. Just he gets on chest and arms. The Mike Bibby workout plan. Yeah, maybe not that. I don't know if he'd be in the league that long after he started that plan. Um, Does he get busted for steroids eventually, or what? Just look at the man. I just mean, look at him now. There's no way. Do you think that's a whoa, natural? Whoa, whoa. We're not just throwing <laughs> accusations. Or hey, that's fair. This is that's... a fact-based podcast. <laughs> Um, yes, it is a fact based podcast. You are that is fair. Um, so who can bench the most on Memphis that the Clippers have to worry about? Basically, I like this <laughs> as a new metric for how who, <laughs> who can bench the most. Um, that's really funny. Yeah, I'm looking at the last five games before the uh, the all star break, and even with those wins. <laughs> so here's the thing the Clippers and Grizzlies have basically the exact same plus minus over the last five games heading into the all-star break which doesn't feel super good um they're both minus three so i don't know let's yeah this but is look a at game. The, like look at the schedules no. i mean like they played so totally yeah it, tra- it's a tra- problem tra- game coming off of playing o- okc in particular that's really yes. yeah and if you lose that game to okc it kind of feels like a must win agree i know with this less than 30 games left all of a sudden, you can't afford to drop a game to the Memphis Grizzlies. So it could tell us a lot about this team and their focus and their mindset, regardless of what happens against, against OKC, but just not either having a letdown or being able to get up for what could be what feels like a must-win game, considering how tough their schedule is. Because if you look at the top four teams in the West, 
The Clippers have the seventh toughest schedule remaining. The three teams around them are all bottom 10 in schedule. Minnesota, 20th schedule. Denver, 23rd. OKC, 24th. And none of this even takes into account how condensed the Clippers' schedule is in March, where I hear they have 17 games. That's my issue with the strength of schedule ratings. Is like This is the percentage of opponents. Playing. Like That doesn't matter. Also, as Will's brought up, <laughs> that doesn't matter in the West. The teams don't play to their percentages in the West with their win percentages. You know, you're not playing a, an eighth seed Warriors seed, you know? Like, so, Yeah, I like what you said about it. It's a must win if they lose to the Grizzlies. Or, sorry, if they lose to the Thunder. Because it is. And that's it might be regardless. what championship teams do. Championship teams I, win this game. Or contender I think one them. game of every back-to-back from here on out for the Clippers is essentially one game is a must-win. Mm, yeah, I would agree with that. How many back-to-backs do they have left? Um, if they want a top three seed, tomorrow's obviously a battle for a tiebreaker between OKC. They've already lost the first two games against Minnesota. Yes, they have two. They more. would be two if they beat if they beat the Thunder. They would they would right. be the two seed. But then they're down 2-1 to the Denver Nuggets with one more game remaining. They are in the least favorable position by far of the top four teams in the Western Conference. So I think regardless, you have to win that game against Memphis. And the standings are getting a little closer now between that top, the 2-3-4 and, or the 2, yeah, 2-3-4 and then 5-6-7. It's getting a little, not... Super close, but it's tighter than it was. Yeah, right? like there was a it's, firm kind of block. It's three, the it's three, it's three games between four and or yeah, between four and five. But like we're we're only a game up on the on the Nuggets. They're they're right yeah. there. Mm-hmm. And I would expect them to round into form more after this break, and you know, with the with the third left of the season. And we play the Kings on Sunday, so this three and four is one team that's elite. One team that we should probably most likely beat. And then one team that is in a weird place, kind of, but has the capability and some of the personnel to cause issues for the Clippers uh, in that Kings roster. They still have two more games against the Phoenix Suns coming up, too. So if you're talking about a team making the leap from five or six and getting into the top four, it's still on the table. Phoenix does have the toughest remaining schedule, according to Tankathon, which I don't know how many of those games are spread out and all that. Chuck, yeah, what's, but... uh, yeah, what's come on, Tankathon, <laughs> get out of us here. Um, <laughs> can we get like an enhanced, can we get like a global rating for schedules? Remember that stupid global rating stat we talked about <laughs> that Hoopsite oh, publishes? Can we get a schedule rating? Um, the international Q rating? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it feels like the Clippers already kind of have to be in playoff mode with these games. Where do we realistically expect them to start looking like they're actually in playoff mode? I think it's like 10 games after the All-Star break is when teams just meet. Bring up the schedule? <laughs> no problem, dude. Um, I don't think they have 10 games, to be honest, because of I, everything I, I mentioned. Agree. Because everybody else has an easier schedule remaining. Uh, everybody else has the advantage outside of OKC with tiebreakers right now over the Clippers because they're down two games to one against Denver. They're down two games to O against Minnesota. They cannot afford to trip up here. And I know it's probably going to happen. They're going to have a two or three game slide somewhere the rest of the way, but you have to, it has become imperative to handle your business against lesser competition. And that means the Memphis game. So I, I don't think they have 10 games. They got to hit the ground running probably tomorrow night. Yeah. I, I'll tell you what I do love. I love this little Blazers break we get. <laughs> Game 68 and 69, which is nice. But, yeah, man, I mean, looking at this schedule, Will, what are you thinking? Like, this is uh, – they, they really do just kind of That's far have to... too late. If oh, no. Oh, late. yeah. No, no, no. I just feel like they kind of just have – they have to start tomorrow. It's kind of got to be tomorrow. Yeah. I agree. They got Minnesota within two of their first almost 10 games here. I mean, what are we talking about? They can't – they lose one of those. They've already lost the tiebreaker. They have no shot. Of and Bucks twice. This is so brutal. There is no time. Yeah. There is well, we were talking about 10 play. games. I mean, that's that's really only – it's like, it's like two, weeks away, two weeks away. The, yeah, like, true. Um, man, that's really worrisome. Uh, 
Will's That's freaking really out. Really worrisome. <laughs> yeah. We may find we'll out flip within the first two weeks post All Star break. We may find out how realistic and how viable it's going to be to have a top three seed. Mm. I like that. How? What do we? Okay, so Sunday games at six thirty, which is great. Um, Nine thirty p.m. Sunday. Have the Clippers gone two and one in this? In this three and four. Yes, I think so. Because well, they have to. <laughs> I like that reason. Yeah, yeah. I think they All do. Right. Two, I, think, I think they go two and one. Anyone got three and zero? Oh? oh, actually, you know what? I'm going to take three and zero. Oh. I think coming off this much rest, this is the perfect time to get a three game win streak for the Clippers in the back part of the schedule with a whole bunch of rest, a game against the. Grizzlies in the middle of it, you know, and then you get some rest, I guess, before you come back home. I'm going to say three and up. Fortune favors the bold. <laughs> yeah. Or the delusional. Yeah, there we go. I'm not, invest- I'm not investing any funds into it, but I hope it happens. FTX. Um, yeah. Um, the only person that commercial who who came out ahead was Larry David, because I think Larry David in that commercial was like, I don't want to invest in this as like a bit. Um, was Sam Bankman in it? I th- felt like he came out ahead. No. Yeah, I, I don't think so. <laughs> um, all right, we're going to take one more quick break, and then we have to talk the Doc Rivers, Patrick Beverly, Austin Rivers, J.J. Redick fiasco mess that happened. Uh, we got ads coming up. Adam looks like he has a lot to say on this subject, which I'm excited for. Uh, we got ads coming up. If they've been too loud for you, go ahead and turn it down. Uh, go- uh, we're doing clips and dip and gossip uh, after these ads and three. Two, one. Welcome back in. It's season two, episode 53 of Clips and Dip. I'm at a Moslem. We got Chuck Mockler and Will Updike. We made sure to have everybody available as we rejoin you guys post All Star break. Couldn't just have one or two of us. We had to have the big three. Now, coming up, we have a uh, big bobblehead giveaway that we'll give the deets on. And, uh, you know, we'll have some new prize to give away eventually here on this podcast, as we always do. But not sure anyone's winning when it comes to this inner strife and turmoil between ex-Clippers and their former head coach in Doc Rivers. Uh, It started with J.J. Redick going off on Espen saying, no, it didn't start with him, Chuck? I think it started with Doc saying insane things. Well... To Did he fair. say some something? What was the most recent thing that was the jumping off point? You're saying Doc talking about how it's harder than I thought it would be coming well, in midseason. It, I think it started with the comments where like I wouldn't, you know, coming into midway into a season is so hard. Like I wouldn't want to be. Road trip. In, in I wouldn't wish this on anyone. Yeah. My worst enemy. Like, like I, I think that's kind of where it started. Um, okay, that's fair. And, and then and he had the and, thing, and that's kind of what. I think that's what JJ was speaking to when he yeah. I mean, went on the rant, like what, you know, that doc never really takes a, a responsibility for anything, which I think is a, a pretty fair criticism. If, uh, if we're being totally honest, in certain ways, I totally agree. Great. Like great human being, um, solid coach. Um, I mean, he's not a bad coach. No, he's, he's a good, he's a good coach. Um, but he's a yeah. he politics really well. Which yes, one hundred percent. I think that I think that's what it is. Is that like I find that kind of stuff to be really grating and like annoying. Yeah. What I've noticed with JJ Redick is he will take things from NBA Twitter and then put them out there on the big platform on Espen, like plumbers. Now, like Doc doesn't take accountability. So, is he in a position of authority? Or does he have any credibility because he played for Doc and people are putting more into that? Well, there's other guys that played for Doc that are then reacting to JJ, reacting to Doc because it was Patrick Beverly who then responded to JJ Reddick. And then Gortat signed off on what JJ Reddick said, retweeting it and putting a check mark. So it so seems fun. like it's split on whether or not Doc Rivers takes accountability and his own son in Austin Rivers kind of stood up for him to a a point or at least gave his opinion on it saying, well, he's the one who gets fired. So he's the one who's ultimately responsible, but there is a difference between him being fired and him coming out and saying, this is on me. 
because I right. think the main uh, source of this energy coming towards Doc is not just what happened recently with the Milwaukee Bucks. It reminded everyone of when he defended all the three one instances in his career. First, talking about Orlando and saying that they lost to the eventual champions in the Detroit Pistons, which I think was actually the Pistons team for the next year, but they were up 3-1 with T-Mac, and that was legitimately a bad team and a bad roster in Orlando yeah. with Pat Garrity and those guys. However, I would say him throwing that roster under the bus doesn't look great. Those were his players. For him to say to the reporters, go look at that roster – Right. That's not great. Those guys suck. Then he defended the 3-1 2015 second round series against the Houston Rockets, saying that Chris Paul didn't play the first two games. Uh, they were beat up, and you know what happened with Josh Smith and Corey Brewer is crazy yeah, in that yeah, game yeah. six. It feels like a bit of an outlier. And then he did take responsibility for what happened in the bubble. But was there something that came out recently about him did he say something about how guys didn't want to be there or Kawhi didn't want to be there or guys? Well, Austin Rivers said guys didn't want to be there. He said guys left the bubble, which isn't accurate. They were asked to leave the bubble. Um, but I think it was that. And then Doc had the quote of like, he, he's, there's been the Shea thing. There's been the, like, there's been like the Harden quotes. It's just like, I don't know. Oh, he I, came out and said he was trying to sell Kawhi on keeping SGA. Yes. So looking like he was on the right side of history with that. And it Harden fit better on the Clippers than on the 70. It's just all this thing with Doc where it's like hindsight's always 2020 with everybody. Um, but it, and the I think it speaks yeah. to it's just of, frustrating. I, it, it's definitely frustrating. I think it speaks to like a bigger thing in sports media and just in general kind of discourse right now is that like it's okay to be wrong. Like there, yeah. there's, true, there's truly nothing wrong with being wrong everybody is going to be wrong and i it's just like i i just i i don't like this revisionist history where it's like this and that and like the shea thing is like not only is it blatantly untrue we were there we were all there we were in the locker right. room for that season like we we all know what was really going down and the only reason shea actually even got playing time and then the other thing that i don't like about that is that also like it's once again it's like throwing Kawhi under the bus. So now this was somehow Kawhi's fault that the Clippers, I don't want to say squandered, but like gave up an All Star level talent. Like that's so silly. He had not like I, I he wanted to play with somebody for sure, but like he didn't have final say on that. And like what does Doc even have to gain by this? Like Doc wasn't GM at the time. It wasn't his call. No one's pointing the finger at him. You know, like I just I don't I don't understand shit like that. And it, I I. It it, hurt, it hurts me because like it was hard for me to even like be on here and with a straight face say I think Doc is a good coach because I think some of this stuff is like really taining all of his achievements for me. Well, I think that that I sucks. think He's he believes coach, it's tainting but. his legacy and his achievements, mm -hmm. and that's why he's defending his record because there's this perception about Doc Rivers now that oh he won with the big three in Boston, but since then what has he done? He's no. Well, there's not though. He keeps getting hired. Big. Like that. That clearly isn't the perception because the guy keeps getting jobs. Front offices versus media perception and fan perception, I guess, are two different things in his mind. And to be fair, he was just in the media recently till taking this job with the Milwaukee Bucks. Uh, I'm a little bit compromised on Doc because you know he was nice to me and. Of course, I, I, mean, I appreciate nice him man. and, and the, yeah. the way he uh, was able to navigate the situation in 2014 with Donald Sterling in that first round against the Golden State more. Warriors in 2020 Did and 2020 nice? like, man, it, during getting, the bubble during yeah. the death of Kobe Bryant. I love Doc Rivers as a man. Uh, the as was his great, teams have favorite, yeah. his teams have come up short at times in the playoffs and. There's something to be said to that too. You just got to take everything into account and not just paint someone as being one dimensional or only being this or that. Yeah. Uh, he's a bad coach and he's a bad, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> the thing, uh, and then last thing about JJ Reddick before we get to some good news, the thing I, I had one of those moments where like the worst person, you know, makes a good point. Um, Nick Wright, who is not, in my favorite uh, sports casters or broadcasters, he had a thing where he was like, why does someone come into this space who doesn't need to come into this space 
and just kind of like shit on the whole thing. Cause JJ Reddick had a thing where he was like, yeah, you know, I can put out, uh, I put out a YouTube video about Zion and how good his possessions are with the pals and it gets 56,000 views, but I go at a coach and it gets millions of views. So like, what does the viewer want? And you're like, first of all, it's not groundbreaking that people like and gravitate towards negative things. Like this isn't like you're in media, you know how this works. And second of all, you can still make the content for the 56,000 people that want to know more about Zion and his, and how he's affecting the Pelican. Like, it's just this weird thing. And Adam, you brought this up. He brings on NBA Twitterisms into the largest sports outlet. So it's like, you can't say you hate NBA Twitter and all this stuff. And then also use their arguments on the show, I guess. He's just messy. I He says he doesn't like NBA Twitter? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Because he's <laughs> definitely <laughs> taken advantage and benefited from it. That's he's de- he's not on Twitter much other than when I see him put out the old man, the three podcast, which is which good, I, which I do appreciate it. Just like doc rivers with what I just said about him. There's a lot of gray. We're not all one thing or the other. Same thing goes with JJ Reddick. I love the granular level he'll get into with the NBA and plays and he'll get into the minutia and he'll get out into the weeds a little bit and totally. really give you a different perspective and not oversimplify things like most of the talking heads out there do. I'm so the best player podcaster. Ex-player. I, like Paul, I like Paul George, but uh, they're both great. I I think he was they're going for low-hanging <laughs> fruit with this doc stuff, knowing yeah, that it would get attention, and knowing that he has to play the game to some extent totally. if he wants to be on Espen next to Stephen A. Smith and next to Shannon Sharp. But don't That's just what it is. Game. Yeah, like play the game. Don't complain about the game that you're actively playing and benefiting from. Like, yeah. I don't know. Well, I mean, it, that's all I'll stop once actual basketball starts. What's interesting is you have guys in the media and NBA analysts on TNT constantly crucifying the modern game totally. and being wrong with their lack of memory Everything. about how the old game was often uh, and misremembering how things were. Nostalgia is a hell of a drug for those guys, and they love their brand is essing on today's game and saying how much tougher it was back then. I don't like that either. I think JJ sometimes takes it too far with calling those guys plumbers. I think it's somewhere in the middle, like most things are. Totally. But all these guys, to some degree, have an agenda. It's unfortunate. And they they have to if they're going to get on that platform. Yeah, that's the real issue. It's I heard Dan Levitard go after Stephen A. Smith the other day saying you birthed this hot take culture, basically. And it's true. It's undeniable because that is what gets ratings and that's what gets viewership and then therefore advertising. So unfortunately, that's what this media uh, has become or sports media. I'm hoping there's a hot take bubble going on where people are starting to tune that out more and more. Because you know it's just a show, it's just hot air, and these guys really don't stand behind what they say. And that's why I like holding people accountable for takes sometimes. Because while they get all the love on the front end of saying something outrageous, or at least attention, maybe not love, love and hate, I want to make sure if that doesn't come true, that they look like fools afterwards. So I will often post stuff from Kendrick Perkins because – If there's no accountability, there's a greater chance they're going to continue to do this over and over again because nobody's checking them on it. This is the dog peeing in the house so you put its face in the pee strategy. You know, I didn't think of it like that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I always think of that Dallas announcer who was so mad at James Harden for absolutely no reason. The guy who's like, you're the problem, or whatever he was saying. Like, can't grow up. Um, But but he ultimately wins, right? Because we never even knew about that guy before he did that. And I don't know his name now. Nermal? Is his name Nermal? No? I think that was the cat in Garfield or something. It is. It's the gray one. Uh, (laughs) All right. You know your Garfield. Jim Davis with us here. (laughs) Yeah. Um, worst comic of all time, baby. Um, all right. We're gonna we have a wholesome update on the zoo bobblehead win here. Um, Starman Ho, who wrote a touching poem 
that referenced every fun little thing we do. Um, seeded the bobblehead to Alfonso Lopez. He gets the bobblehead. Um, a young Clips fan gets to add to their collection. They're kind of excited about Zoo. <laughs> not the most excited. And but Zoo. We, were, we respect the real. There's, you know, we love that. Um, Adam out of sight, like a out kid of doesn't know ball, Adam. What are you gonna get? What are you gonna pull receipts on this kid? I hope it doesn't get lost in the mail somehow. <laughs> okay, no, we're not doing that. Um, it is a California address, so Adam gets to save a couple, couple bucks, which is great. Um, yeah, we'll get that shipped out this week, and it should be to your door soon. Um, I think that about wraps up this episode. Will, are we doing double dips? Where where can these people find us in these next couple of days? Yeah, so with uh, two games coming up on the back of that, you can catch us on AM 570 after the games. If it's a win, I'll probably be on. If it's a loss, I mean, that's Chuck's domain. Uh, <laughs> but you can listen to this podcast wherever you get your podcast. Uh, if you happen to listen or check us out over on uh, Apple Podcasts or Spotify, if you could leave a little rating and review. It would help us out. Um, we'd love it. Uh, if you if you want to get the whole experience of the show, the the full, how many senses are there? Six, five, five, whatever. The full sensual experience. Well, we're over on six YouTube. with dead people. <laughs> yeah, there's six. With dead people. <laughs> we're uh, we're right. over on YouTube. That's uh, at Clippers Podcast, and we're online. Uh, Twitter.com at Clippers Pod anytime. We're Very surfing nice. the net. We're surfing the net. Uh, don't snake Catching our way. Tasty so. waves. Yeah, uh, we do this every episode. Some people's favorite thing. I hope no one's least favorite thing. Um, Adam, let's get one positive thing after after this all-star break about the clips. After six episodes, the new season of True Detective is finally over, and my God, it was a mess. Uh, no, the Clippers are back, and James Harden, I talked about that quote he gave to La Murray earlier. It sounds like this team is in the right headspace, in the right mindset for what they're about to embark on, which is one of the most brutal stretches Maybe in the history of the regular season, 17 games in March coming up. So it's going to take uh, an intense amount of focus for them to get through this. And it all starts against OKC. So I just like the fact that they seem to know that they have to ratchet things up now. Stop with the bad turnovers. And they've been pretty good in that area all season long. But there was a little bit of slippage at times heading into the break where you just saw some unforced, untimely, or uh, impromptu times turnovers in fourth quarters. The Clippers have to be more sure with the basketball. The best thing he said was, we can't beat ourselves. If someone else is going to beat us, you know, as Coach Lee would say, as LeBron would say, you can live with those results if you play your best and you just got beat by a better opponent. But the Clippers cannot beat themselves. They cannot take themselves out of the ball game because while their margin for error is very wide right now with the talent they have against OKC, against Minnesota twice coming up, against the Milwaukee Bucks twice coming up, they can't rely on that. Listen to what Kawhi Leonard has been saying. They've been getting by on talent. They need to get by on execution. Talent comes afterwards. That can be the difference maker eventually if both teams are executing at a very high level. So I think the Clippers are ready for this. And like Chuck said, they might go 3-0 these next three games. Let's hope they do. P.J. Tucker and Bones are back with the team, so there's some reinforcements everyone can be excited about. Uh, we will have the double dip for y'all after the next two games, maybe an episode on Saturday. We're getting it figured out. Um, thank you to everyone for listening. Thank you to everyone for watching over on YouTube. And as always, let's go Clips.